Hey everyone, how's it going? My name is Bowser, or X45X, and in today's video, I want to talk about movement as baiting. This is actually a topic that is very hard for me to make a video on because, while I've been wanting to, I've just wanted like the perfect example, and thankfully, last weekend at Riptide, Goblin gave me the best example I could ever ask for. So I want to dive into an example um, a little differently than my other videos. I'm going to just play the segment, talk about it, throw some gameplay up when I need it to describe or explain something. But uh, let's jump right in. So this is game number two, top eight. Goblin's up three stocks. Um, the buzz is at two, just came off the platform. And, and at first, like, we're just fighting, right? Like, calling out some Pikmin, getting some hits here. And then DeBuzz gets called out here. And look at how long DeBuzz stays in the corner. Starts by hitting some Pikmin, some shield pressure, one call out not letting DeBuzz leave, and then look at this. That sequence we just saw was nothing but movement, and I mean it. Absolutely nothing but moving around and causing problems. So what makes this such an effective game plan? Well, in a couple of my videos, you've heard me talk about threat range, that range where your moves are pretty effective, hard to react to, and the opponent might be expecting them, right? Like, where can you land dash up jab or down tilt or, you know, short hop nair? From this position, and I'll find a good screenshot of it right now. From this position, and let's just imagine there's a little Olimar here, maybe I'll put one on screen. Um, from this position where Goblin is, there's something really important to talk about. How many moves can pressure DeBuzz in the corner here? How many places can DeBuzz legitimately jump or move away from Goblin? And the answer is not a whole lot. On a theoretical level, if we could run every single scenario, Goblin can cover jumping, going under, trying to go up and around, trying to throw projectiles, everything DeBuzz wants to do can be covered. Now, it is humanly impossible to cover every single option. However, one expects someone to maybe attempt to cover the option, right? Like maybe Goblin will swing and try to catch DeBuzz jumping or catch DeBuzz trying to go underneath, but that's not what happens. Notice what happens. It's just movement. It's just trying to get the buzz to pull the trigger or swing or get comfortable enough that the buzz wants to move out. And then Goblin does meet the buzz right here in the corner and just a couple of swings and the buzz had to retreat. Now a little bit of stage control gets lost a moment later, but look, it doesn't take long for Goblin to just put the buzz right back in the corner. That sequence was almost entirely movement. And it was just the threat of what could be coming. And Goblin simply covered one spot and ran up and shielded and was still able to hold it down. That's what makes the sequence so impressive. Now, you might be wondering to yourself, what makes a game plan like this so good? Like, why, why does this work? Well, there's a few factors. First of all, let's talk about the basic one, the time on the clock and the percent deficit and life deficit. Essentially, DeBuzz will lose in roughly five minutes if DeBuzz doesn't do anything about the current state of the game, which is that Goblin is winning. So it's pretty hard to camp. The commentators were even talking about how DeBuzz likes to really put himself in the corner and have people approach him, but that game plan sort of backfired because Goblin was able to use that retreating game plan to hold DeBuzz hostage in the corner. And now DeBuzz is at 56% on second stock and Goblin's still alive at 119 as of this current frame. And DeBuzz, you might be wondering, like, why didn't DeBuzz just, like, throw an attack or run and then roll? Because a lot of those options are reactable. If Goblin plays his cards right and moves around the platform in a way where DeBuzz thinks he can do something, Goblin could simply react. And that actually happened earlier. DeBuzz was able to get called out. Let me try to find the moment. It's right here. DeBuzz tries to come through and do something about where Goblin is. And Goblin just straight up fares it. Now, I'm not sure if that was DeBuzz pressing a button trying to catch Roy in the air, or if that was an actual punish for the roll, but the point stands, that sort of thing can happen. Now, it's after this hit that Goblin just takes a sweet time, but DeBuzz also has no idea this is coming. Maybe DeBuzz is expecting more shield pressure. Maybe DeBuzz is like, yeah, I'll get something ready for an out of shield punish. I'll try to call out Goblin. And then Goblin doesn't give DeBuzz anything for a minute. And that means that DeBuzz probably wasn't ready for it. And now DeBuzz is throwing Pikmin, 
hoping to get an opening. And the moment Buzz tried to, Goblin was right there on top of him. He didn't really get anything out of these first two hits, but it's just that positioning and that coverage alone from the movement that made DeBuzz pick the choices that he made. That's why movement is baiting is so effective. Just a quick clip for you here. Watch any part of Tweak versus MKLeo at Grand Finals. You're gonna see it all the time. How many times is Byleth moving in respect of a banana? How many times is Diddy moving knowing that Byleth might be able to catch the banana or cross up Diddy safely? And you'll see it literally over and over and over again as they try to call each other out. And they'll even take trades and whatnot, what they can take, trying to reclaim a better position and establish their game plan, but neither of them can truly establish their full game plan. Their entire game plan revolves around both of them trying to establish their game plans on each other. So it turns into this spacing baiting war and sometimes you use attacks, sometimes you misdirect with banana or, you know, an arrow. But at the end of the day, both these players are doing nonstop movement, trying to call each other out. And if you look at that movement and where they're respecting the spacing, I think the match unfolds. You can really see what these players are thinking and worried about at any given moment in time. And you might need to watch it in slow-mo or take some pauses, but it's really high level stuff. And this is a skill I think everyone could use. Where do you use this skill? Well, you wanna use this skill when you think the opponent's gonna be trigger happy, right? You think that they're gonna be playing keep away or something, or maybe they're just trying to react to anything they can find. That's when you wanna start looking for these kinds of options. Because if people are trying to call you out, but you don't actually give them anything, they will expose themselves. They will potentially put themselves in a worse position, press a button when there was no reason to, and they could lose the match for it, or they could lose a stock for it, they could get hit, they could get comboed, or simply lose stage control. And as you might've seen from this example, Goblin getting stage control made the situation even worse for DeBuzz. So whatever neutral was happening beforehand with Goblin just swinging at Pikmin, whatever that game plan was, we got pushed into a corner and now look at how important the stage control and the baiting is. So this is a huge skill to practice. If you want to know exactly how to practice this, find the places where your opponent reacts to you. Move around more. You know, ask, ask to play your friends and tell them you're going to be experimenting with some stuff and just try moving on them every once in a while. Throw out your attacks, press your buttons, see if you can get them to do anything the normal, traditional, like, way of doing it. But see, where do they react to your movement? Where do they think you press buttons? That's the space you want to play around and find out right about where you can go. So... Give it a shot, play with your friends, and of course, if you want to try it live with some good commentary, stop by my streams Sunday through Wednesday now. And we got tournaments every other Monday. It's a really fun time, so I hope to see plenty of you there. And thank you guys so much for watching. As always, subscribe for more because there's going to be a lot more Smash content on the channel, more competitive videos. There's also going to be a little bit of Pokemon potentially on the way because I'm starting to learn like challenges in speed runs for Pokemon. So I think that'll be pretty fun. I'll occasionally post highlights of that here, but let me know your thoughts. And if you do have any other follow-up questions, either find me on stream or hit me up in the comment section. I'll definitely throw you a line. Take care friends. I'll see you all soon.